Hello, future educational practitioners. Uh, Today we're going to carry on looking at social learning theorists, but we are going to look at Vygotsky. So Vygotsky is slightly different from Bandura, but still very much says that all of our environment around us is, um, or our social environment, is what influences and in how we learn. And he he is regularly contrasted with Piaget, who is a cognitive psychologist. Um, and cognitive psychology is one of the next topics that we're or schools of psychology or educational theory that we will look at. So. Um, Vygotsky was, um, um, I can't think exactly, he was a similar time to um, Pavlov, I would say, so turn of the century, so quite an early one, um, again, but actually his theories are still particularly relevant today, and you'll see uh, in one of the cognitive theories, you will go, well, that's just Vygotsky's theory, so you will find that some of these overlap and just, a sl and just change ever so slightly, um, but if anything, that almost reinforces the importance of them. And sometimes it's important to know why the, the theory behind them and why these techniques work. But actually, if several theories are suggesting the same techniques useful, then it should give you more confidence. So Vygotsky called children little apprentices. And the idea was that he um, that children learned through being paired with an expert. And that expert could be anybody. It could be a peer. It could be a teacher. It could be a parent. It could be somebody off the street, although possibly some safeguarding issues there. But children just need a little bit of expert help. So they would observe and watch somebody who's a little bit better than them, and that would help them improve. So exactly as it says there, you need help from experts. And Vygotsky, uh, Vygotsky's theory is the most significant theory, I would say, for, or for a key practical skill that you will need to develop. Sometimes it's called scaffolding, sometimes it's called differentiation, but ultimately this, all, this idea of individual or unique learning all comes from Vygotsky and something called his zone of proximal development. So we have here the, um, a, a circle which represents everything that I can do. So as a student, it's all the things that I can do. And then this circle here, which probably is about the right size because it's massive for me, um, is all the things that I can't do. So things that there isn't any possible way that I could do at all. Uh, so these things in the middle, I can do them on my own, dead independently. That's absolutely fine. These things I can't do at all. And then this is the peak area or zone. Some people call it the struggle zone because here it's too easy. Here it's impossible. It's too hard. It will put you off. This is perfect where you just feel that bit of struggle. OK, and I would recommend. So when you think about your your um, self-reflection, I want you to think of a time when you've just struggled um, but eventually you've been able to do something. And that is an example with some help, with some guidance, that is an example of um, the zone of proximal development. You've just needed that bit of support. And sometimes you call that support scaffolding. And because children will all be at different levels, um, then the scaffolding needs to be different for each child or each student. So this happens at all levels, all the way up to higher education as well. OK, so the zone of proximal development, the zone of ideal movement forwards okay and one example that I use so again without wanting to steal from you so I've tried to use my own educational environment is teacher marking and peer marking so this is the idea if you think you work you need an expert you need somebody to work with or you can write an essay and then I can sit with you and we can go through it and I'll talk, tell you how you can improve it. And that is an expert. That's the most simple form of Vygotsky. There's loads of other ways that you could do it, but it's ultimately that. So, for example, let's start with, we'll give an example of small children first. So um, a child can do simpl simpl bleh, simple multi multiplication and addition. They've got that down. They're fine. They can sit and do hours and hours of those if they want to. What they couldn't possibly do is uh, is um, long division or long multiplication, so very complicated ones. But what they can do with help is they can start to do simple multiplication and division. So they can divide things by two and they can times things by two, but they need their teacher there to help them or they need a peer, a, a, somebody sitting next to them to give them a bit of guidance, okay? Oh, this is some, a way of thinking about it. So first of all, and this is the scaffolding. So at first, what we want the children to do is it's completely out of their reach. It's very, very difficult. So first of all, we would model as a teacher something. So, for example, if I was trying to uh, teach you how to write a persuasive text, I would show you all the persuasive text that I had written. 
Then a guide, so mostly the te so mostly the teacher helping out. Uh, I, in the model, I would show you a piece of persuasive text that I've written, and I would tell you why it's a piece of persuasive text. The next one is as a, as the teacher, I would give you some other persuasive text, and I would ask you to pick out those, uh, or I suppose we'd go through together, and we would pick out the the techniques that make it persuasive. Then, mostly focusing on the student, I would then give you some examples and ask you to pick them out independently. Uh, and we'd just go through them at the end, and or possibly you'd work in pairs. And then finally, I'd ask you to write a persuasive piece of text. So going from me giving you the example and talking you through it, all the way up to you completely independently looking at the example. OK, and that's how you could move through this zone of proximal development. And then finally, you incorporate the skill that we're trying to teach you, persuasive text writing, into things that you can do. So this might be persuasive writing in a newspaper. But what you can't do now is you can't all you need help with is how to write a persuasive piece um, for a debate. So um, we're constantly trying to move things from the zone of proximal development into what you can do independently. And as soon as we've done that, we go back into the struggle zone and pick the next hard thing that you need to do. OK, so an example of the zone of proximal development and the scaffolding that I put uh, as teachers we put in place to support is for psychology, writing an evaluation point. So what child, um, students can do usually is understand the evaluation point during class discussion. So if we're talking about it and they're listening to me talk about it and listening to other people talking about it and possibly adding to an evaluation point themselves, then um, uh, they can do that. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with listening. Uh, and I think you might have this experience yourself. You think, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. I can do that. Then you try and do the next thing, the next bit of it, you know, the next step independently, like write it up and you think, nope, not a clue. So, and that's where your struggle, and then you think, yeah, that's where the struggle zone is. So they can understand it. Uh, what they can't do at all is independently structure an evaluation point. So this is right at the start of the year. However, what they can do with help is write an evaluation point with some scaffolding in place. So for example, uh, structuring an evaluation point when there is an example shown to me. So what I can do with help, I can have the exam one example next to me and I can have a go at structuring a different evaluation point using that one as well. Another thing might be sentence starters. So all of my uh, psychology students will shudder and dread as they hear a strength is, for example, this is a strength because um, sentences. So there's just those sent sentence starters to guide you off on the structure. And also something else that might have scaffold and help people get closer is if they're given an example and they're asked to identify the strengths and the weaknesses of that example or the mistakes or the good things about it if you're given to market yourself. So you might struggle to write a piece on your own, but the first thing you can do is start to pick apart somebody else's work, which would then help you move on to the next step. So this struggle zone is where you want all your students to be all of the time. But you can't, because they're little apprentices, you can't just leave them in there to do it on their own. They've got to be able to do it with help. You've got to put this scaffolding in place that will support them. OK, again, if you're not sure of anything, just drop me a message and we and I can give you some uh, some uh, other videos to watch or some different reading to do or we can talk about it ourselves. It's such that's a re that's one of the vital ones, a really key one. OK, so what I'd like you to do if you're going to write your reflective journal is can you identify a time that you found something difficult, but with support, you're eventually able to achieve it. So ultimately, what I'm asking you to do is identify a time you're in the struggle zone and eventually you've moved the um, the struggle zone, the zone of proximal development. You move that skill into your things I can do. OK, um, so you've moved through that process. How did it feel? and what it helped. And of course, at the end, it probably felt great, but how did it feel going through the process? Um, and what was useful? What helped? What skills? Was it a teacher? Was it a peer? Was it something a teacher did with this? Was it something your friend did with this? All of those different things. And did anything make it difficult? For example, the way people spoke to you. So sometimes you could be in a struggle zone and actually it's not very nice at all. It's too hard because somebody doesn't quite approach it in the right way. So the struggle zone is all about accessing help. So if they don't offer the help in the right way, um, that might make things difficult. And hopefully that will help you reflect on you as a teacher. And then what can you learn from your experience of needing something scaffolding if you were supporting someone else? So if you were going to go on to be a teacher, what what can you learn from that experience that you've just considered? And then practical applications. So applying your knowledge uh, and reflection about social psychology in your classroom or in educational institution. So or institute. So just remember, it could be the whole school or it can be one one class, whatever you one activity. Um, so 
yeah, as you can see from there. Um, how might you organize your classroom using the knowledge of Vygotsky? OK, so knowing Vygotsky, how would you ensure that students were in the struggle zone and how would you put some scaffolding in place? And that could be absolutely anything that you want. Be as creative as you want. One specific activity, um, a much broader concept across the whole course or in the whole institution as a whole. So how might you organise something in your educational environment? Um, you could eat and, and, just, and remember, kind of span it out. It could include parents. It can include anything that you want. Okay.